Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out uh, after the great storm of what well, didn't really happen. Um, so welcome to the 169th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Um, yep, electronic device issues. All right, so uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from Ronald Bradford uh, about MySQL forks. Uh, Ronald has his uh, current credentials up here, uh, like a press and list of publications, and he's uh, active in the community. We, we uh, hope to all enjoy his talk. Uh, and anyone who is watching from home, hopefully, will be out there. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have the regular uh, set of uh, requests. Please silence your cell phones, turn it down, um, turn it on buzz. Please don't use the coffee maker during the presentation, either for coffee or frothing or anything that makes a tremendous amount of noise. It's fairly disruptive. And um, when we come around with questions, please use the mic for questions so everyone can hear. Raise your hand, one of us will run around and put the mic in front of you and try to get, uh, get everyone to be able to hear you directly. Uh, we'd like to quickly thank uh, Google. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have this fantastic space. Um, we'd like to thank our other sponsors, um, who are IBM, Canonical, uh, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. In addition, Nilo would not be able to function without our many volunteers who contributed greatly over the years and are continuing to do so every day and every month. After the meeting, we encourage folks to join us for more talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub. This is our regular after meeting uh, drink up. It's at 250 West 14th Street. Uh, we'll have a couple of groups heading over at the end, so if you're not ready immediately, they'll uh, right up until the end, we'll have people uh, leaving you out there. Uh, for those of you who know the location, though, please just feel free to go and be there. Um, we have a reservation in the back. We've asked them to keep the music low so it's conducive to talk. So, uh, a few quick announcements. Uh, next month, we will be hearing from James Turnbull on Logstash, which is a log transport delivery filtering mechanism. It's uh, the amazing reason are dealing with logs. If you've ever dealt with logs and you haven't used Logstash, You'll probably enjoy the talk. It's a bit eye-opening. It makes things really easy to use. Uh, I am clearly speaking as a user who really appreciates the, the ease it's made. Uh, where, how easy it's made my life dealing with blogs. Anyway, um, so uh, please check on meetup.com as that meeting approaches and uh, sign up. Um, our next workshop will be June 18th. Please find Rob Menez. David Bristow or James Meldrum, if you have any questions about the workshops. And here's where we open it to anyone who has announcements from the crowd. I know we have one here, but I want to take mine. Hi there. Uh, I run Unigroup, the New York City Unix Users Group. Uh, it's at unigroup, unigroup.org. And uh, you can grab me after the meeting if you have any interest in it. Uh, we do topics related to Unix, Linux, and BSD, and all related technologies. We have a heavy Wall Street crowd. So meetings sometimes are pretty technical. We like it that way. High performance computing, and tend to be Ethernet and faster, and different things. And I realize that applies to many people these days, uh, like Google. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday uh, at the Shore Research with Ops in New York City. That's the League of Professional System Administrators, another group that you might be interested in. Uh, Sunk, Solaris, or Oracle Solaris kernel engineers were there. We had a couple hours talking really technical things uh, about Solaris internals. Our main meeting is next week, third Thursday evening is our typical meeting, and we have a Solaris 11.1 release meeting. Again, Oracle presenting, and uh, it's planned in the future. Uh, check out unigroup.org to get on our mailing list or give me uh, your contact information, and uh, we'll wait on. <coughs> That's it, thank you. Does anyone else have any other announcements? events if you'd like to speak up. All right, so uh, everyone, please welcome Ronald. Uh, we'll take questions at the end, if that's all right. That works a little better. Yes. So if um, you have questions, just pull them until the end. Yes, generally I would say if you have any questions, feel free to ask, but for the benefit of streaming and for using the microphones for questions, um, try to write them down and remember them, um, and we'll fire off there. But if anyone misses that request, I'll try to remember what's going on. Uh, so, um, I come from a background, actually we were just talking beforehand, uh, I started working in Unix in 1987. I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, I actually used to do Unix kernel core dump analysis back in the day when I would pretend that I knew about C. So, I've been around for a little while. Uh, today, I focus predominantly on enterprise data architecture, which is what I've been doing for all the 20 years. Um, and 
MySQL related uh, either hardware or cloud based technologies. So when Brian asked me to talk about the state of MySQL, um, I had to really think about what's the best way to describe that. And it's interesting if you actually go to Wikipedia and look at like how uh, Unix, uh, the various forks of Unix or the various forks of Linux, be it uh, the Debian side of things, the Slackware or the Red Hat side of things, you know, there's like 50 variances of Ubuntu. Um, just the off, off, group, off um, Debian, for example. So there's quite a lot, but there seemed to be some structure to it. But what I found is, is that the best way to describe MySQL's ecosystem right now is it's a bit of spaghetti in MySQL balls. So hopefully tonight I can dispel some of the things. I'm, I'm taking guess that most people in the room are actually system administrators. Yes? All sysadmin guys. So. Um, you have a combination of developers coming to you and say, oh, I just want to install this, I just want to do that, and go on. So, the goal tonight really for myself is to just give you a bit of a history of the MySQL ecosystem, where it currently is today, where it's going in the future, and just prepare you for what's happening so that when you know, developers come to you or when you want to consider doing certain types, types of operations, you know what's going on. And at the end, I put in a few slides about tips so that you can take those away and apply them to your existing environment. I think I already mentioned a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been doing this for a little while. I've focused on MySQL now for about the last 13 years. I do quite a lot of speaking and presenting all around the world. Um, I have worked for the past for MySQL Inc., the company that, that owned MySQL prior to acquisition of the Sun. Um, and uh, ironically, I actually worked for Oracle, doing Oracle work in the 90s. Uh, right now, I actually do independent consulting, so come and see me if you have any specific MySQL needs or questions. So this is what I'm going to be covering tonight. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of a history, uh, dig up a few war stories, and hopefully that might interest a few people that uh, have been around in the traps for a while and may have uh, seen or have to do things that I really like. Um, there are a number of different distributions and variances, so I want to discuss those. And um, unfortunately, leaving questions to the end makes it a little bit hard, but uh, please, if you do have any questions, uh, I'm happy to go back through things and discuss them in more detail because there's quite a lot of information that I can share. Um, there are various things in addition to just MySQL, the software. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the patches, the storage engines. Uh, which is a, a, um, a unique thing with inside MySQL, and then go through a few of the other things in the ecosystem that are important. So I guess to sort of start off, because I'm not really a comedian, but to actually put a little bit of a, um, a fun and humor into things, um, a long time ago MySQL started um, in about 1994. And so, uh, looking at this graph here, this is my very poor attempt at drawing the slices of spaghetti and meatballs. Uh, otherwise it would get really kind of messy. So MySQL started in around uh, 1994 with three people, predominantly Monty Medinius, which is the person that you most commonly associate with MySQL. Uh, it was originally under a different uh, company name. In fact, Monty actually had a, uh, his own company called Monty Program, uh, which has since been reincarnated. Uh, to work on one of the variants I'll talk about later. And so what's happened is a little, little development along, but effectively, if you've ever worked with MySQL in the past, these numbers will make sense. There's version 3.23, version 4.0, version 4.1, and version 5.0. Who here is not running MySQL 5. something? Any brave souls running? Oh yes, okay, what are you running? I'm breaking out passwords. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Any MySQL administrators in here? No? Uh, it's very rare to come across a pre 5.0 environment, but there are, they, they still do pop around. I mean, if you have a certain piece of functionality and it works inside the environment, those versions are actually quite stable. It's like running, word, you know, like running um, WordPerfect 5.1. You used to write letters perfectly. Why ever go to a GUI system? Yeah, I, I know. Okay, so 323 is still around. I mean, 323 was released uh, 12 years ago. Um, in fact, I have another graph I can show you that in a minute. So, what happened in the ecosystem was um, at about 2008, Sun Microsystems acquired MySQL. Um, we were about, I was working for the company, we were preparing to IPO, 
So it was quite exciting to actually work for a software company and think that your company was going to turn those options into shares uh, and then we were acquired. But at the same point in time, there was another company alongside MySQL that most people weren't aware of called Enobase. And Enobase actually produced the INODB storage engine. And for those people that are a little unfamiliar with MySQL, there is MySQL, the product, the interface itself, and all the infrastructure, or something we call the Hamilton. And then there are storage engines, and I'll discuss them in more detail later. But the primary storage engine used today, and for most systems, even prior to acquisition, was the INODB storage engine. It was actually owned by a different company. And it was quite tightly integrated into MySQL as, soon, as early as 3.23. Now, what happened and was what is an interesting part in some of the history is in 2005, long before Oracle actually acquired Sun, Oracle actually acquired the company Enobase, which ran the NODB storage engine, which is predominantly what's used inside MySQL. So this is you know, the first sort of like a fork in the road where if you don't understand some of the history, you may wonder, okay, uh, you know, why did Oracle do what they did or is Oracle doing the right thing? Uh, sometimes you've got to go back and look at everything that's going on. So they actually, they actually acquired an open source company quite early. I don't recall the exact date when uh, Berkeley DB was acquired, but that was another one in the technology stack. Um, sorry. And then, oh, sorry, I think I was missing the wrong, I wasn't looking at the right slide. So yes, and in 2005, Oracle acquired Enobis. So what we generally um, recognize is MySQL as the most popular uh, open source database for modern web applications. Uh, that's generally the slogan that they use. And from a history perspective, you can generally associate that for two reasons. One, very early in the piece, they got into the Linux distributions. So when you got a distribution, you downloaded it, MySQL was readily available. There wasn't a complexity of trying to install it. It has a very low footprint, it's quite easy to install, unlike you know, if you try to install Oracle, for example. And because it became the M of the LAMP stack, it got a lot of association with that as being the database portion of the popular programming stack. So that moved along all well, and then along came the acquisition by Sun. Now, um, in an upcoming slide, I'll show you some of the timeline it takes to release products. And you can see in 2005, we released version 5.0. But 5.1 wasn't actually released until after Sun acquired it, towards the end of 2008. What's also interesting is if you want to look at a bit of a history, um, there have been several failed versions that have come out. Versions that were released but never actually got to GA, which is general availability. So they're in some form of alpha or beta state. Um, there was, uh, after 5.1, pretty much parallel development, some in 5.2, and then some also in 6.0. Uh, the 6.0 stuff is related with the storage engine called Falcon. And then uh, at the MySQL conference in 2009, um, on the date there, which was the 21st of April, Sun announced that they had released MySQL version 5.4, uh, which had a lot of things to be able to particularly run very well uh, at, the, at the Solaris level, the D-Trace implementations, and we're providing new features. However, that news of the first day of the conference was spoiled because the day before, Oracle decided to announce that it was acquiring Sun. And uh, I wasn't working for MySQL at that time, but I believe that there was some uproar that Sun decided to continue to make a product announcement after such an acquisition had occurred. So these are some pivotal dates in the sort of history and legacy of um, some of the MySQL things. Now at the same point in time, you know, MySQL is a GPL product that runs on the GPL v2 and uh, I'll talk a little bit more later about some of the patches and variances that are available. But for a few years before that, uh, a company known as Proven Scaling, founded by a former MySQL employee, started doing a little bit of work on the side in terms of providing patches for MySQL and providing a, um, another area to distribute things. And in fact, to this day, I believe they still actually run a mirror for very old versions of MySQL. And they released a few miscellaneous versions. There's nothing of any significance there, but the name is important because 
this is part of how the MySQL ecosystem started to grow. There was another um, product called Our Delta, uh, which came out of another company called Open Query, still in running today. Um, a company, ironically, also formed by a former MySQL employee. And they tried to take some of the work that was being done by other part of other providers, specifically at that time Google was doing a lot of work with MySQL, and trying to package these things together as well. So again, neither of these are, are basically in operation today, but they're names that uh, form part of the history of what's going on with MySQL. So now we get to where we are today. Um, I haven't heard any announcements today, so I believe the slides are still current. However, I did give a presentation yesterday at the Cloud Computing Expo, and only that morning there was an announcement by Amazon a few hours before I spoke. Um, so, um, since Oracle has acquired MySQL, they've provided two general availability releases, MySQL 5.5 and now MySQL 5.6. Uh, their goal is to provide a release approximately every two years. So they're reasonably on target with that, and they're currently working on 5.7, the next version. Uh, there's a cycle of producing what's known as these development milestones, uh, which can be different types of pieces of functionality that you can test. Uh, and then it will go through a beta release candidate and a GA implementation. But right now, the water is a little bit more murky. Uh, because now we have mainstream variances of just the MySQL product. So we have, when I refer to MySQL, I'm referring to MySQL, the trademark product of the trademark owner's Oracle. They haven't rebadged it to being you know, Oracle ME yet or Oracle slash MySQL. It's still pretty much an identity of MySQL. So let's hope that it stays that way and doesn't uh, fall by the wayside by like some other um, open source acquisitions. So back in 2006, uh, there was a company formed called Pocona. This time, not by one former MySQL employees, but two former MySQL employees um, formed this company. And at about the same time that the acquisition acquired, uh, they released their first version of their server. And uh, it wasn't originally called Pocona Server, um, but they were in the business of uh, looking at improving the product uh, looking at providing additional patches. And some of the reasons for doing this was because certain companies, particularly Google for example, were very active in providing patches to improve the product to meet functionality that they needed at the time. And what happened was the MySQL engineering cycle was just taking longer and longer and longer. Uh, if you look at the dates, you can see you know, 2005 for 5.0, but then 2008 for version 5.1. So it lingered on for many years, and I have an upcoming graph, which is a very good example. So what happened is, these companies are, are starting to work on this, you know, the, the uh, non-recurring engineering, or NRE work, to do some level of customization. You now there were uh, companies that were doing their own work, but you know, there was a need to be able to like introduce new features, and so along came Pocona Server. Uh, and as you can see, um, they changed their numbering system to match more closely to the MySQL release cycles and they've had a version 5.1 release and a version 5.5 release. They currently do not have a 5.6 GA release, they have a beta version. But you can get the kind of server which is uh, effectively built off the version of MySQL but they have their additional patches that are included. Uh, some of those things in terms of performance, uh, they have a modified version of the NODB storage engine which I'll talk about and uh, a lot more instrumentation. And so this is one thing that MySQL has lacked over many years is how well do you instrument the product? And in this day and age where we're doing so much volume, you can lose sight of the fact that the product early in the days just didn't have the level of granularity that you'd like. In 2007, I was working at eBay, and one of our criteria was a certain number of transactions, a certain percentage of a certain number of transactions under five milliseconds. There was no instrumentation in MySQL to even calculate something at a millisecond granularity. And so we had to invent that at the time. So being able to have these other companies doing this work, that certainly helped in many areas. Unfortunately, having contributions, but then having a, a commercial company as being the owner 
of the trademark, not a foundation. Most patches have never actually got into the minus world baseline, uh, which is actually quite disappointing. And then also following the acquisition uh, or the announcement of the acquisition uh, of Sun, um, there was the uh, recreation of Monty Program. People think that uh, Monty Virginius created Monty Program, but actually there's a company, a long-standing company that he had long before um, my school came along. But he uh, took some of his windfall, uh, grabbed a number of uh, key employees, and created his own organization to produce a new product called MariaDB. Now, so if we're looking now in terms of variances, we have the Oracle MySQL version, we have the Kona server version, and now we have MariaDB. Uh, MariaDB has released a few different versions. They actually went from 5.1 to 5.2, 5.3. I thought they created a 5.4, but I didn't see the release notes, and then a 5.5. But they've now, since the announcement, they're changing the numbers and the next version will actually be 10.0. So just to, to mess up the waters a little bit more, uh, at least the numbers were consistent, you as a system administrator may have some understanding as to how, it is, how it's going to vary. But if you don't, uh, it's going to be a little bit crazy. This is actually a diagram from Wikipedia which gives you a good timeline, as you can see, as to how long certain products have been in development. And particularly if you look at 5.0, uh, which is uh, this, this, this one here, uh, and 5.1, I mean, you can see that the development has uh, pretty much been even three or four years just to get to a general availability, and then it's been ongoing, but none of these products are actually in, um, in use anymore. In fact, I believe, even though this is saying uh, 5.1 has active development, um, there's no active development happening in 5.1. So even now, this day, if you're using 5.0 or 5.1, you've reached end of life um, for many years. So just a little bit of information that um, leads to history. I mean, it would be nice if we were sitting at the bar right now talking about it so that we could, you know, just share some uh, stories about it. Uh, the Sun acquisition happened very quickly uh, in about six weeks. The Oracle acquisition took nine months. Uh, which seems like a long time, and for those that really want to know the detail, feel free to ask me. Um, part of it actually came from uh, some disagreement within the, uh, you know, the founding fathers of MySQL, uh, including information petitions uh, all the way up to the EU, and things were held up into the e, um, EU Commission. Um, now I don't, I, I use Wikipedia a lot. Uh, and so I like it as a resource, but I'm not a person that's going to quote something without uh, secondary sources. However, it was interesting when I read that part of the information from WikiLeaks was something that was sent by Oracle to the US government um, um, asking for some leniency in the EU decision. So just to add a little bit more fuel to the fire, is that true or is that untrue? Um, we don't know. What we do know is, is that Oracle uh, is the owner of MySQL. Um, they've made a strong commitment to continue to be uh, actively development in that product. They are still doing that. They have more engineers and they do more work than they did than Sun and MySQL did. So they're doing a good job. I mean, it's the stigma of the name that quite often affects people who are die-hard open source people. And then there are people that I meet that just don't even know or don't even care. So. Uh, what I can say is they are doing a good job, um, they are trying um, to integrate with the open source community. I've been invited to, uh, to Oracle before in terms of their worldwide leaders, user groups uh, as a representative for MySQL and you know, we, I've sat down with the Java guys and we've you know, commiserated over like, how can we actually fit into this uh, big organisation. Um, some people uh, like to think that Oracle bought MySQL to kill it. Well, the truth is Oracle didn't actually acquire MySQL. I like to say to people, well, they got it for free because they acquired Sun. So that doesn't mean that MySQL wasn't uh, an integral part of what Oracle, uh, MySQL wasn't an integral part of what MySQL Oracle wanted. I mean, they wanted to get into the hardware business, they wanted to have a total stack, but they also want to be the leader uh, of technology across the stack of all the components. And so MySQL fits into one component of that, which is modern web applications. 
Um, and um, it is when it reaches GPL, I don't think it will ever change, but there will always obviously be a GPL version that's available, so uh, it's not actually going to go away. So I've touched a little bit on the uh, distributions of variances, just to recap those. Um, we have the Oracle MySQL version, uh, that comes in two flavours, it comes in a community version, uh, which is the GPL version, and it comes in an enterprise uh, subscription based service, which includes support includes an enterprise backup product and includes an enterprise monitoring product uh, and um, also support for like um, rapid updates for any critical patches etc. There's the Vacona server uh, which is quite popular obviously by, by Vacona the company which I think at last count has 50 plus employees around the world so it's, it's the one of the larger companies in the MySQL ecosystem uh, and then you have MariaDB which is uh, founded by Monty Vinitis, the original one of the original creators of MySQL, part of the, um, um, part of the um, Monty program. Um, what I want to point out is two things that are important about MariaDB is um, they have always stated that they are fully 100% compatible with MySQL, and so it's a good way for that to be a drop-in replacement. Um, and in some respects, some distributions have taken that path. But they are actually now moving away from being fully compatible. Uh, they've elected, they, they for example have implemented certain features and then Oracle have implemented their version of a feature and they've now elected that we're not going to take Oracle's version, we're going to use our, we're going to use our version of that portion of code. Um, however, on the flip side, there are certain features of MySQL that all trademark owners, MySQL Inc. the company, Sun and Oracle have failed at and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that have failed to help the ecosystem grow well and so MariaDB is far more open and flexible in that area. Um, so in that respect that's good. I also want to point out that there is a different, also an, a, another type of uh, MySQL distribution that you may come across and that's a storage engine specific variant. Um, and I'm going to go into a little more detail what that means but that's a, you can also see another version of MySQL <coughs> floating around. Uh, you may have read in the press information about MariaDB, um, which by happenstance also starts with M. I don't know if that's a lucky coincidence, but it's still part of the LAMP stack. Um, a couple of distributions uh, have already decided that they're planning to move towards MariaDB. Um, I know in the past Ubuntu has thought about doing it, but they currently still offer MySQL and, uh, as an alternative MariaDB. So this is going to be interesting. So I mentioned before that one of the reasons why MySQL became popular was it was packaged with the distributions. Uh, as we move forward, if it's packaged with these distributions, is it going to become just as popular? Uh, it's interesting to read some of the thread uh, about why Fedora chose the product and, um, you know, is it because MariaDB is better or is it because they want to get back at Oracle because Oracle has Oracle Linux or is it some other reason? It's hard to say. There is a lot of politics. Even MySQL, the company itself, um, as it started to grow before acquisition, had a lot of politics. And so it's one thing to work for a small ecosystem, but then also to be able to uh, you know, turn it into a commercial entity, uh, there are certain things that um, change the way that you may feel about it. And so, again, there are people in the MySQL ecosystem who don't feel that Oracle is a good steward just simply because they're a large commercial closed company that are only out for profits. Um, you, that can be said for any company. That can be said for a Google, for a Facebook, for all, any other company that's trying to, trying to actually make money. Now, I've mentioned a few times storage engines. How many people in the room do not know what a storage engine is? This is that forces you to actually you listen to me and put your hand up other than pretend to be asleep. Good. So, uh, in layman's terms, a storage engine is a layer in, is, a, is, a, is almost a self-contained portion inside MySQL that allows for you to store and retrieve data in a relational way. It's as simple as that. So, using the MySQL, using the SQL interface that MySQL has, trying to follow the ANSI standard, you can get and put, you know, CRUD operations against the data and the storage engine will manage that information for you in memory and disk. Now you may ask why you'd want to do that. Storage engines have various characteristics. 
Ultimately, a storage engine generally comes down to how can I do something in a performant way. So certain types of workloads work more efficiently depending on one structure or a different structure. So there are different types of index algorithms. Generally, you hear of B tree algorithms. So my, my ISAM, the default storage engine, uses a B tree algorithm for its primary key and its secondary key. NODB, for example, uses a different B tree implementation for its primary key. It's actually a clustered primary key. And then, uh, uh, again, another variant, but, this, but also a big tree index for its secondary indexes. The memory storage engine, for example, uses a hash for its primary key. Um, different locking strategies are in place, whether they do a table level locking or a row level locking, whether they're going to provide a multi-version concurrency support or not, uh, whether they're going to provide the uh, consistency or durability uh, characteristics that you might find in different products. And the other thing that's key is there is this concept of transactions. Now, most people in the audience will understand what a transaction is because you've been around long enough to know what a database is or what a database does. Uh, ironically, when my school started, it didn't have transactions, which is actually quite surprising because in this day and age, with the new vogue of uh, NoSQL products out there, the concept of a transaction is actually foreign. Uh, which is actually quite sad when you try to explain that to somebody who just doesn't get it. Um, I guess that means I'm getting old. Generally what it means is a storage engine, the goal of the storage engine is to improve performance for some type of characteristic. Now there are effectively nine, I think it's in total ten, uh, um, uh, yes, ten uh, historical storage engines. Uh, that you see from the 323 moving forward. There's my ISAM, which is was the default storage engine. This is a non-transactional storage engine, um, which is very good for high reads and even high write loads, but not good for mixed workloads because its locking strategy is table level locking. NODB is the product that I mentioned earlier, which was a different storage act engine that provided transactional support, provided multi-version concurrency um, and uh, has since Oracle took ownership in uh, of MySQL become the default storage engine and that's actually good because a transactional storage engine is what the database should have and it more closely aligns with the concepts of other relational databases in Oracle specifically so it's, it's thinking in, uh, more like what you'd expect. There are a list of other storage engines that I've got up here I'm going to go through them in detail memory, archive, federated, merge, black hole, CSV, example, and there was a Berkeley storage engine. So out of all those storage engines now, Berkeley is the only one that's not available. Federated actually is uh, not compiled by default. Um, they have their relative uses. Um, those uses are generally rare, um, but there are cases where you might find a need to use one of those. So just be aware of them, but the average person you'll see my ISAM and NODB. Now, you can have a mixture of these. In fact, I'm looking at a, a site just yesterday, um, and the mixture is all over the place between you know, 20 tables in my ISAM and, and 30 tables in NODB or whatever. So you can do that, but you have to realize that there are two important things that you lose when doing that. First of all is you lose transactions, because my ISAM is not a transactional storage engine. Okay, transactions, ensure that you have consistency. That means a one, an all or nothing approach. If you have three statements, if two statements work and one statement fails, then the first two statements will roll back. My ISAM doesn't even have a transactional like mode in one SQL statement. I can write an SQL statement in my ISAM that has to update 10 rows. It can fail at five rows and the first four rows will be updated. Um, so buyer beware. Now, um, the moving to INODB is obviously something you want to do, but you have this transactional barrier and the other thing that's most important for everyone in the room as a system administrator is they have different memory configurations. In fact, this customer that I'm dealing with right now, because of this mixture, have this like 4XL server uh, in Amazon and they haven't configured the one important buffer. They keep increasing the size of the server trying to get more performance, but they haven't changed the one buffer that they need for the storage engines that they're using. So I actually have a couple of points on that. As a system administrator, you can you know, get a lot of love from people if you just change one setting sometimes. 
Now, what happened in around 2006, uh, in the early 5.1 days, was MySQL created this concept called the Pluggable Storage Engine Architecture. And as the name suggests, it means a third party vendor can take their product and plug it into MySQL and do what storage engines do, which is accept their SQL statements, read and write data. That's all you need to really know about. Um, obviously, there are different characteristics and what you want to work on. So then you might ask the question, why would anyone ever want to develop a storage engine? What purpose is there in doing that? Well, you've got to realize that M was part of the LAMP stack. LAMP stack is very common. Connectors are in uh, dozens of languages. And so if you could actually write something that plugs into MySQL, then automatically every programming language that connects to MySQL can now connect to your product via the MySQL's SQL interface. And there are different ways in which we may want to access the data. So there are certain things that can actually open up a lot of opportunities there. <coughs> now I mentioned that there are two primary storage engines, one's called MyISAM and one's called NODB. NODB came from a, another company and was compiled into MySQL. However, now there are at least two variances um, of NODB. There was what's known as the NODB built-in, which was what was compiled into MySQL. And just to share a little bit of history and trivia, because uh, I know you're all, all, all interested in a little bit more than the boring details. Um, MySQL at its annual conference released a new version. I don't recall which version it was. Maybe it was uh, 5.1. Um, and they were all excited because like, here's the new version of MySQL. Well, secretly, Oracle, who had acquired Enobase, the company, had been working on improving the NODB storage engine. And because that was built into MySQL, they were limited to MySQL's development lifecycle. But with the pluggable storage engine architecture, they were able to create their own new features in a pluggable version. And so at the same conference, the day later, they came out with, oh, we've released the NODB plugin. <laughs> the problem is, is they released that, and then at the same point in time, because MySQL released the new version, it broke the plugin interface. So it wasn't compatible. So here's two companies not talking to each other. So in version 5.1, <coughs> there's actually two different versions of NODB. So if you're using 5.1, you may find that some performance features are actually in the plugin as opposed to in the built-in version. So again, the reason why people would do that is because the development life cycle of the MySQL core was taking too long and now there was a chance for improvements to be made without having to be dependent on the actual major distribution. Uh, I mentioned earlier Pocona Server. Uh, Pocona, the company, they created a fork called ExtraDB, which is a fork of NODB, and that's also available now in MariaDB. And there was a company called Schooner Tech that had a modified version of NODB. They were acquired by uh, San, SanDisk, I think. Uh, but that's really no longer around. Uh, MyISAM has also now uh, sort of branched off into uh, what's now known as ARIA, which, which right now is providing crash safe capabilities and will in future potentially provide transactional capabilities. So my ISAM right now is non-transactional, but uh, Aereo will potentially get to being transactional. Hopefully you guys are writing out all these questions because you know, um, there's lots of fun in answering. So a lot have come and a lot have gone in the pluggable storage engine architecture. There are companies that have spent lots of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars to take their product and try to integrate it into MySQL and it hasn't worked successfully. It hasn't worked for a number of reasons. One, MySQL 5.1 dragged on for so long to be released that companies created this and then they just, they just couldn't wait. Uh, Nitro Security is an example that created the Nitro Storage Entering uh, that have worked independently in the security industry. I actually worked on their certification so I could speak a little bit about detail. And it was blisteringly fast. It was 20 times faster than NODB to write data. It was that much faster. Uh, the problem is, was it had to go through the MySQL pluggable storage interface. And while that was designed, it wasn't totally flexible for all these different products that are coming in. And one of the shortcomings of this architecture is, is that all the new storage engines have had to fall foul of this you know, this, this way to implement something 
but it's not completely flexible. And my school, the company, Sun and Oracle are all at fault for not being able to make this as extensible as it should be. And then there are also different characteristics. If, if anyone here actually understands database theory, when you understand when you use an index, a multi-column index that has columns A, B, and C, when you select from that index, if your database query doesn't use column, if you're using like columns A and C, then it will only actually use the first portion. The index is the leftmost portion of the indexes. Well, with NitroDB, they broke that paradigm. You could have an index with A, B, and C, and if your query didn't use uh, column A, it would still use the index. So different technologies had now changed the way in which you could do things. Um, there were many others, I don't want to go through a lot of these here, but uh, Kickfire was an example where they tried to integrate it more into the hardware level. Um, Google actually produced something that worked with the file system, so you could actually like, you know, do, you know, select from C, you know, slash proc slash CPU info effectively and get, you know, OS level statistics inside the database, which was great. Um, uh, Acubarn is one here that I want to talk about later. They originally had a storage engine that was integrated to MySQL and they have pivoted from that. I'll come back to it. But there's a few more. Um, Falcon I mentioned before, which was an acquisition that never got to production. The good news is there is still a vibrant ecosystem in place. Uh, and these are some of the uh, names that you will hear or may hear if you're focusing predominantly on um, MySQL. Tukatech. Um, is a company here that's actually based out of uh, Boston. They have an office here. They're regulars at our uh, meetup. And in fact, uh, um, they spoke last month. I have some details of slides later. Um, there's a new commercial product um, that just was released uh, called DeepDB. Uh, there really isn't too many specs on that because uh, it's um, a commercial product. Um, there are two in the data warehousing space that effectively are taking MySQL which is great for OLTP and moving it towards various data warehousing capabilities. So here you're getting the SQL interface, but you get a column orientated store underneath. So you've got InfoBride and CalPont who created InfinityB. They both have open source and commercial versions. So now this is an example of you still are using MySQL, you're still using the MySQL interface. Your programmers don't have to learn something new. You don't have to roll out a different uh, connector within your programming language, but now you could be connecting to a traditional uh, OLTP system, but then also be connected to a data warehouse, uh, which is running a variant of MySQL. Now, some of the storage engines will plug in natively to MySQL, some of them will not, because the interface in between isn't quite right. They haven't, you know, they're missing a parameter or something. So that's why you sometimes will find a variant of MySQL which is compiled by the storage engine provider. Ultimately, you don't want to do that because then you're relying on them to provide changes. This is where MariaDB comes in handy because MariaDB is more friendly to the ecosystem and they're applying those things and so you can get a packaged version of, for example, Tukatech with MariaDB without any, uh, without any issues. Uh, there are some other storage engines you want to be aware of. Sphinx, which is a C-based full text, um, has always had a sort of um, uh, close relationship to MySQL. Now it can be completely integrated by a plugin storage engine. Uh, there was an IBM DB2 um, <laughs> System 5 um, storage engine written. I'm not too sure why someone would write that, but uh, it was written. Uh, just this year there was announced there was one for Cassandra. There's a um, a, a company that provides a graphing engine, and there's, there, there are others that are probably floating around. Uh, I can't say this list is, is exhaustive. There will be something that someone will come back to me when I post this on Planet High School saying you didn't talk about X, Y, and Z. Um, and so um, there are different things that people can do. So that was a long-winded way to say that there's a lot more complexity uh, in MySQL than just installing MySQL the product. Um, so, um, while some of you may be vegetarians, uh, that's the meat portion and then the spaghetti portion. Um, so, a little bit about the ecosystem itself. It's a GPL product, and so various companies and organizations have contributed to MySQL in different ways. And I've mentioned a couple of them. I mentioned Proven Scaling, which was one of the first companies that started providing patches, and eventually one of their patches actually got into MySQL 5.0. Uh, about profiling, it's stuck around for a few versions and it's actually kind of handy because it 
gives you microsecond granularity of running your query of, of, of instrumentation. Um, Google was a very large proponent of doing work initially, even back I think in the 4041 days and 50 days. Um, they did a lot of work in features that they wanted, but they couldn't wait for MySQL to release them. And in fact, some of those features have now finally been rolled in into versions 5.5 and 5.6, and some of them haven't. Um, but they certainly helped perpetuate the ecosystem itself, and the driving force of that, uh, of several people that worked at Google, one being Mark Callahan, uh, left and went to Facebook. So ironically now, Facebook is basically the largest person providing patches towards MySQL. They have several uh, significant MySQL engineers that have worked, that were co-workers that worked at MySQL, uh, and that's pretty much one of the largest uh, dedicated shop of resources in a, in a, in a non-services company. Um, so if you ever hear these rumours that you know Facebook is throwing away MySQL, well, they actually have some of the best engineers, so that's unlikely. Um, different companies like eBay, I did work with eBay, uh, Twitter, um, the person who did work at uh, MySQL that created Proven Scale and recently went to Twitter and was doing some work there, but I believe actually he's just left Twitter and gone to Google. Um, and uh, there are other various storage engine providers. The ecosystem itself in MySQL is kind of small. Um, it's a shame now. I mean, we don't get to see alumni as much as we used to at the usual conferences. It used to be great every year to get together. We sort of all disbanded and moved away. Um, ironically, um, some of the people that moved away actually went on a product called Drizzle, which was originally sort of a fork of MySQL and then became its own sort of unique product that wasn't completely compatible uh, with MySQL, but they did a lot of work for the ecosystem. They really cleaned up the code, they cleaned up the way in which you should test and deploy things, and they went a long way to striving towards creating a better product. Uh, stripping away a lot of the crud that wasn't quite working. Um, the unfortunate side effect of that is um, that team never really got mainstream. It was, you know, um, there were a number of developers working on it. It was acquired by Sun, and eventually it was cut by Oracle. And um, most of those people actually went and worked at Rackspace, so it was deployed in Rackspace, and then it sort of lost its work there. They sort of like finished up there, and then a number of those people went on to OpenStack. Uh, and so there's an incarnation of people that now work for OpenStack either at Rackspace or at like HP. So there's always this lineage of like where my role at, uh, employees now work, uh, which is actually quite funny. Uh, one thing that did come out of it was uh, LibDrizzle, which was a library, uh, which was released under a BSD license. And I will not get into the rationale of how GPL code became BSD code. Um, However, some people actually like some of the features in that, which also provided MySQL compatibility. Um, there's another product out there called Galera. It's from a company called Codership. Um, and their claim to fame is they provide synchronous replication. Now, I haven't really gone into the specifics of MySQL. I mean, there are many things that we can talk about. But one reason why MySQL is widely used is it's very easy to create a replication topology. It's very easy to create slaves, copies of the master data, and be able to create read, uh, highly read scalable environments. The thing about that is replication is actually asynchronous. Which means once it's committed and saved to the master database, the acknowledgement goes back to the client so it can do more, more work. That data then will replicate to uh, the other databases. And it may or may not actually replicate successfully. It may replicate the command initially in statement mode, but not actually make the same data changes and you can get data drift. So there are all these sort of caveats. Uh, one of the things that Google first did was creating this sort of like, like semi-synchronous concept which is like I'm not going to commit until I get an acknowledgement that at least one slave has written a change, which was one of their patches. And eventually uh, a variant of that came into MySQL. So Galera uh, is actually a different product um, which then sort of basically has a, um, an interface into MySQL. And so it uses MySQL to provide what's known as synchronous replication. So two servers will always have the same copy of data. Uh, and those two servers are hot. Unlike, for example, DRBD, which if you're using like an under underlying file system based replication device that's giving you synchronous operations, that second server is not hot. Um, now, there are variances of this. Pacona and MariaDB both have bills that include Galera 
So here's an example of you know something that's added on and you either compile it, but now you're starting to see these derivatives in place. Um, ScaleDB is another company that I don't really know too much about, but it's still current. Um, now I mentioned replication, which is the way in which data is being transported around. Um, and there is actually a competitor to MySQL replication known as Tungsten. So you can actually use MySQL the server and elect not to use MySQL replication to keep the data consistent in other databases. So there was actually a competitor out there. Uh, one of Tungsten's claim to fame is they can replicate, uh, it's an open source product that can replicate from MySQL to other types of databases, including Postgres, including Oracle, for example. And they recently, in April, announced the open sourcing of all the other portions. So if you're, for example, here are an Oracle shop and you're looking at the various products like the Oracle's expensive Golden Gate or something else, or how do I get my data from Oracle to MySQL, for example, here's a way to do it. This product is open source, we'll actually do that for you. And so you can actually like bring data between different disparate sources. And um, there are also cases of being able to put into like Vertica, which is a commercial data warehousing storage engine. So that's an interesting concept. Uh, Drizzle, for example, rewrote their entire replication as well. Um, and they base that on top of uh, Google's proto buffers. So it's a totally different way of doing things as well. But it, it also meant that uh, they were passing around proto buffers, so therefore, you know, RabbitMQ could read them appropriately. So it was a different way of doing things. So there's quite a lot going on out there. And not to be daunted by the fact that these are different versions that you can install, there are different versions available in the cloud. Amazon provides Amazon RDS. They provide uh, two variances of that. One is read replicas, which is akin to a typical MySQL topology being asynchronous. And they provide what's known as multi-AZ without diverging, divulging what it actually is. Effectively, it's sort of like a DRBD implementation where you have one server and you're getting a synchronous replication at an underlying OS level and a cold standby. Uh, Google have their own modified version, um, which I believe now is GA. Um, OpenStack includes it, but a lot of the emphasis is sort of like was moved to HP, where a number of the developers went into HP to create a database as a service. Um, I, last time I checked, it was using Pocono, but this was an example of where Drizzle, either as in, for infrastructure or as another product, may actually come into play there. Because I know several of the Drizzle people now actually work at HP, so I'm sure somewhere in there, uh, we may see the re-emergence of Drizzle in the mainstream. Um, there are people and uh, products out there that appear to be MySQL, but they are not MySQL. <laughs> we talked about storage engines which are built into MySQL, so it relates to the requirements of uh, the security model, the query optimizer, the parser and the optimizer, which sometimes can be at a disadvantage, as I mentioned before with Nitro. You know, the, the, the parser and optimizer has an expectation of indexes, columns A, B, and C. But if your storage engine can do something different, but MySQL internally can't do it, then you're actually at a disadvantage. Or if you keep more metadata, for example, uh, MySQL might not be able to support it. But MySQL itself, uh, the communication for all the connections is just a protocol. It's open source, so different products. There are proxies, for example, that talk to protocol. There are a couple of other products like Clusterx and around which effectively look like MySQL, but are not, in fact, MySQL. So underneath, they're completely different. They have different needs for monitoring and instrumentation, uh, code base, etc. There are a couple of other products that, that are known that I don't really know how they work that, that are listed there as well. Um, so just be aware of these in the ecosystem itself. Now, we talked about the database. And uh, for all those people that have tried to scale a database, um, you can only scale it so far until you realize that the developers who wrote the code really should have learned how to write SQL and not use an ORM or framework. Um, unfortunately, that's a dying art. Um, there are some products in this space that actually help to basically effectively augment the capabilities, you know, provide some type of agnostic sharding or some other black magic to enable you to scale your database in more detail. Um, Parallastic is a new company, uh, which I don't know too much about, but is, is receiving good press, uh, certainly got a good uh, amount of venture capital. Uh, are actually speaking at the meetup group that I run next week. Uh, I'm actually the organizer of, of the Effective MySQL 
uh, user group here in New York. It's the only active MySQL user group. Um, and so if I know there are a couple of, uh, of regular attenders here, if you're more interested in MySQL, if you're more interested in different technologies, uh, feel free to join the group. And uh, so we have a presentation on that next week. Uh, I'm actually interested in myself knowing that because part of my job in providing scalability of systems, uh, generally I will be able to cut down their just footprint, cut down their query volume, tune their configuration, all those kind of things that are really simple and kind of do blindfolded. Um, but there's a point in time where you can only do so much until someone changes the code. Um, and when you get to a point when your system really is just bulging at the seams and you have to consider this magic term called sharding, it's not a simple process. So if one of these products can go some way to alleviating those things, it may be a viable solution for your organization. Um, support is something that the ecosystem um, has benefited, benefited from. Originally, support just came from MySQL, the company, but now Bacono and uh, Monty Program, who recently joined forces with a different company called SkySQL. Ironically, Monty Program, founded by a former MySQL employee, SkySQL, founded by former MySQL employees. Um, if you haven't seen the pattern so far, um, there's a lot of MySQL employees that go out on their own. Um, so um, one benefit here is you don't have to, you, you might have installed the MySQL community version from Oracle. You don't have to go to Oracle for support. There are other companies that do that. There are other companies that can do support on an incident basis rather than a subscription basis. There are companies that can actually provide patches and fixes to what you want to do. Um, that reminds me, I did forget to say that, uh, so I knew someone would, would comment on the storage engines, I actually remembered myself. There are many commercial storage engines that I haven't even mentioned. MySQL, the company, and other people have actually written storage engines to do work for companies, maybe to integrate with a legacy system, for example. So even though I've talked about ones that basically is public information, there's a lot more that's out there. Um, so one of the benefits of what's happened here is now you have some freedom. So that gives you uh, something to work with. So what's happening today? Well, today, the superstorm, and I didn't realize there was a superstorm, didn't happen. So welcome to everybody who came. Uh, thanks, Brian, for inviting me, I think, eight months ago um, to uh, put this in my calendar. I wish I was that organized for organizing meetings. Um, today, we have MySQL 5.6. I'm not going to discuss MySQL 5.6. Uh, there were a couple of presentations that I gave a few months ago, uh, both here in New York and uh, in Boston, so they can talk about some of the features and capabilities um, regarding that. Um, the one engine or product that's getting a lot of traction these days is Tuka Tech. Uh, it's a company that came out of Boston. They have a large uh, office here in New York. Um, they have a different indexing strategy. It's known as a fractal tree. So when I talked before about different storage engines doing different things, they store their data in a transactional ASIN compliant way. So that's the things that you want to hear. Um, but they use a different way in which they're storing the data on disk and they use compression very well. And so they get better performance when you have a large disk to memory footprint. So there's a point in time where Tukatech is actually going to perform better than the current version of NODB. And so that's one differentiating factor. Uh, there will also be certain types of operations that are more beneficial. Uh, constant writing uh, to data and having multiple indexes with actually having uh, clustered uh, indexes, cl clustered structures on those indexes may be important for your application. Um, they have a community version and if not today, yesterday, um, in an email released their enterprise version with an addition to support as an online backup tool and, and other features. Um, uh, Mark Callahan actually came to the user group last month, my user group here in New York, and spoke. Uh, so there was actually a presentation uh, on the website if you want to get a little bit more information about that. Um, but those guys are very approachable, and so they were actually a closed source product that announced that they were open sourcing uh, the product in April. And so immediately they're getting a community benefit from that because now uh, it's a little bit more easier to look at and use and, and get updated. Um, there's another product that uh, really was only just been announced uh, called DinkDB. Uh, there's not a lot of information about it. Um, again, it's one of these companies that's worked at Stealth. Uh, they're a commercial company, um, but there's something to be aware of. So if you're like fishing around for now, how do I handle big data? What are the issues or how different people are doing things? 
uh, and working inside MySQL, this is another pluggable storage engine that you can consider. Um, how much time do I have? Do I have a limit on time or? Probably another uh, 15 or 20 that's minutes. Great. I, I, that, that's great. I, I, I'm not going to be going along with that. There's going to be at least 30 questions because there's so many prizes to give away. So I'm sure everyone is like, you know, anxious about that. However, if I'm going to talk about, um, if I'm going to use the, um, the analogies of, uh, you know, uh, meat and pasta, uh, I better talk about what sits on the side. Um, and that is the fact that now there is this nuance called NoSQL. Now, MySQL actually, the company, had three products. Uh, two are currently being developed, uh, and I'll give a prize to the person who can announce the third product, if they can remember. Um, but, they, but you have MySQL Server, the traditional product that you're aware of, but there's a completely different product called MySQL Cluster. Um, and if we dig a little bit deeper, it's actually MySQL NDB Cluster, and NDB is actually known as Network Database. It's actually a different storage engine. Um, and effectively, uh, if you don't break it apart anymore, it's really its own product that uses the SQL interface also in MySQL. So it has a native C API, and so you can actually use this massively highly available um, uh, shared nothing architecture to store and retrieve data in a NoSQL way. So long before the fancy term NoSQL, Here's a product that's got a MySQL badge on it, but it does no SQL. And many large telecommunication companies, telecommunication companies and gaming companies around the world run large MySQL clusters. Uh, uh, in, uh, MySQL cluster uh, clusters. So this is now where we get into a bit of a confusion when I start talking to SQL Server people or something else. Um, what exactly, you know, what's a database, what's a schema? Uh, it's a poorly named product, let me put it that way. Um, there was some work done by uh, Yoshinori, um, uh, Matsumi his name, who I can never remember, um, at a company, uh, another fellow former MySQL employee, uh, I consulted in the team that I work with, uh, who worked with a company and created a concept called Handler Socket. And this was effectively creating a key value interface directly into NODB. And it created a lot of hoo-ha about now I can store and retrieve my data much more faster. Um, it's still inside NODB, so I'm getting that transactional capabilities and durability capabilities, but I don't have the overhead of security or parsing or optimizing. Um, so MySQL 5.6 and the latest cluster, MySQL cluster, I think 7, 2 or 7, 3, they now also have what's known as memcache APIs. They're both different interfaces, but basically now in 5.6 you can talk to an INODB table via a memcache interface. The memcache is actually built into MySQL, I don't even need to install it. And so you can actually get improved read and write throughput um, to your data. So MySQL is thinking about, you know, what's this NoSQL stuff really mean? You know, has it really got any traction? Uh, how can we get along with it in some particular way? I'm not going to talk about NoSQL, it's another topic unto itself. Uh, I haven't got a presentation on it, so I'd be happy to come back and share a little bit more nuances on that, but in a nutshell, you really have a key value store, a document store, or a graph store. Um, you know, they're just the types of ways in which you're storing and retrieving data. And there is a large number of products out there. I'm just listing a few that just come across my radar. Um, but I will point out that practically every company that I go to and work with, they never have one relational database product. They generally have more than one relational database product, and now they generally have more than one NoSQL product augmented to that relational product. So I'm not too sure here, but if you're in an organization and the only database store or data store you have is MySQL, you're a little behind the times. Um, so I leave this question to you is, why can't you have both? Why can't you have the flexibility of a NoSQL product? MySQL started here, they've created this memcache interface, which is get and put, which is a key value store, kind of this select from table where ID equals X, you can just get and put it. Uh, why can't you actually have the features and strengths of both of those products? And there are different things out on the market, but I just wanted to share one of them, uh, which is, I mentioned before, a storage engine called Akiban. And they changed the way in which they were storing data. Originally, they were a storage engine, that's how they started off. And they would group the data differently on disk so that they would improve performance 
by particularly in tables of the data uh, where you did a lot of joins and they made things better. And they've since sort of uh, using the, the lean startup approach pivoted some time ago and they've gone away from that and now they actually create and they actually have a database as a service offering that you can uh, use on the web. Uh, where you can create a data model and they don't care how you access it. They don't care if you use a RESTful interface, a JSON request or an SQL query to get the data. They're managing that underneath the systems and they also have some very exciting information coming up soon about their uh, high availability and fault tolerance which will make this option even more, more, more uh, of benefit. One thing I talked about in a presentation that I gave to um, GoDaddy many years ago now um, was, you know, as the advent of these products coming in around was the data interoperability. How do you move data from data store A into data store B and know that it's consistent and know that you can use it? So if you're going to look at any of these types of products, um, you know, if you have Memcache here now and you're using it as a caching tool, you know that invalidation is just a pain. Uh, when do you invalidate? You know, do, is it a read? Is it a write-through cache, or is it a, a read back? All this sort of operation. So, and when you start putting some data in memcache, some data in Redis, uh, you have all these other things to consider. Um, one of the things that Akiban does provide is they have a way for you to import data directly from a MySQL dump. So you're getting the power of at least it being able to be migrated, and then you can use their SQL interface or their RESTful interface to access the data. So. Um, there's some promise there. I, I haven't analysed their product uh, in this new version. I, I just spoke with them when I, when I was up there a few months ago. Uh, but they're a good team of people and they're making a lot of waves. And I feel that this is going to be a, a new generation of things. There are a lot of people out there that are doing NoSQL. And quite honestly, all the younger generation that are using NoSQL really have no idea about relational theory and why things like transactions are important. Uh, and it's really good when you get those. Um, I didn't mention it, but Tukitek, for example, which is a storage engine in MySQL, uh, they actually compiled it into MongoDB and gave MongoDB transactions. So there's a NoSQL interface, uh, you know, a, a very popular JSON thing, uh, but they actually extended the syntax, and now you can actually store multiple operations and collections inside Tukitek and get even better performance of what MySQL is providing. So, you know, some good can come out of storage engines that may not end up being mainstream MySQL. Um, but I felt if I spent all night talking about what MySQL was and be something you'd go away and you wouldn't actually take away something meaningful. Um, I didn't put a lot of detail in here, but and I can probably reference you to some other slides. But I wanted you as system administrators to go away with just enough nuggets of information to actually look at your MySQL installation tomorrow and make a couple of changes. The first is you should really keep the versions of software up to date. If you're running 5.0 or 5.1, then you're really behind the times. If you're running the default version from the distro, then you're sort of locked into release management hell. You know, particularly if you're using like a Red Hat or CentOS 5, for example, you're in the dark ages. Um, so that can be that can be an issue. And that can be an issue, also an issue in terms of if you're managing large systems, what sort of configuration management you use to release products. But all the distros basically provide um, um, you know, Debian or Red Hat compatible packaging. So you want to be able to look at those things. Um, what I don't have on the slide is also some of the um, different connectors. Like there's a, most people run PHP somewhere. The new MySQL connector, for example, that's available at 5.4, no longer has a dependency on the, on the MySQL lock client library. If you've ever heard of like MySQL lib client 18 error or 15 error, I'm sure any system administrator in this room, without having a Perl DBI DBD error, the other most common one is a lib MySQL client error, um, that goes away when you actually use the new version of the MySQL driver. Um, so that's another motivation also to look at the client versions of software. Um, the number one thing you want to look at, reiterated just today with a customer, and I know I had this on other slides and I, and, um, I didn't pull up the slides, is the first thing you want to do is tune your MySQL database to use its memory properly. For MySQL as a dedicated server, then it's really simple. There are only four global buffers and then there's a whole pile of session buffers. Um, if it's a shared server, then you have to take into consideration your overhead of Apache or web server, um, web container or PHP, etc. Um, but I'll just share two points about the storage engine in a minute. 
Uh, I want to point out two things because uh, one of the things that I focus on with clients is sharing wisdom about a simple concept called business continuity. That is, how does your business operate when something breaks? Um, and there are, there are two things I want to share for system administrators in the room who may not administer MySQL, but if you have to administer MySQL and you may not appreciate it because you want to use Postgres or some other database, um, you need to consider these two things. One, people will use MySQL replication, that is, create a copy of the database and put it on another server. That's great, but it is not a backup and recovery strategy. I can go into a discussion as to why, but just because you have replication doesn't save you up. The second one is, as with any organization, as with any product, as in an operating system, as in the way in which you do patches and upgrades, be prepared for disaster. So I'm actually talking to a known group here where your system administrators, you know what a disaster is and you probably experience a disaster. If you're developers, they've probably never heard of the concept. So uh, just, you know, be prepared for that. And um, I'd like to talk about, um, you know, I, I come from the days where I remember in the early 90s in Oracle systems, it's like, okay, we've spec'd out the system and we have a large Oracle database and we have a general ledger table with 200 million rows in it. And as the architect, I wanted to add an index to that table. And I talked to the DBA, and the DBA goes, oh, we can't do that, that's, like, that's going to be like four, I can't remember the exact number, it's going to be like four gigabytes of disk space, we can't get that kind of disk space to add an index, that's kind of crazy. Um, and it's like, those were the days where you could never test something because like you had this production system but you could never like have a test system because you never had the size of it, things like that. And the advent of the cloud today is great because when people come to me and say, well, I, you know, I can't test my backup recovery strategy, I go, there's only one piece of hardware you need and that's your manager's credit card. Because <laughs> once you have that, you can, pretty much, you can pretty much get whatever you want. Notwithstanding the issues of security, at the time it might take the transfer and you know, bandwidth costs, whatever, but you don't actually need any more hardware. The cloud gives you that. Uh, gives you that. The cloud is many things, but in a nutshell, it is just one thing. It's infrastructure on demand. It's infrastructure as a service. Everything else is built on top of that. Um, so, just a tidbit of that. Wow, I didn't even change the title of my slide. That was terrible. Um, <laughs> If you're in MySQL DBA and you know nothing about your database, this is the first and only thing that you need to run. Uh, you can get it off my website uh, where this will run a little simple SQL statement and just give you just the most basic stats about how large your database instance is and what storage engines you're using. Uh, there is a companion to that that works on the first schema table that drills in in more detail. But this is important information because the number one thing you want to know is what storage engines you're using. Because if everything's in my ISAM, tuning is going to be different than everything's going to be in NODB. Um, there really are three things, and, and I apologize for not putting them in the slides there, but I'll send a follow-up email to the group. Um, there are three buffers that are important. One's known as the key buffer, key buffer size, as it's been renamed. That's for my ISAM indexes only. So if you have 20 gig of data and 4 gig of indexes, making the buffer 24 gig is kind of useless. It's a global buffer and it's not going to be used because only the indexes are stored in the buffer. My ISAM relies on the file system cache to store data, okay, the stored pages of data. Where if you have the NODB storage engine, then both its data and indexes, which are generally stored in one, what's known as common table space, uh, IB data, IB data one, IB data, uh, or multiple table spaces, both data and indexes are stored in that particular buffer, known as the IDB buffer pool size. Just tuning those two appropriately can make all the difference. I'm looking at a system today that's running some mega large system that I think had like 30 gig assigned to the IDB buffer pool size, and the default 16 meg defined to my ISAM, but half their data is in my ISAM. So I'm going to change that tomorrow and go, yeah, okay, here's my bill for changing one configuration variable. Um, the other thing to consider is if, your vol if the load of your system is high um, read load, then there's a thing called the query cache. 
Now, defining what high read to write ratio is is a little bit more complicated <coughs> than just saying select this variable, but it's not that difficult to do. Um, but by simply tuning that one variable if it's not enabled, may also give you a huge performance improvement in your system because now, if the data's not changing, MySQL will actually cache that information. And rather than going through a minimum of 17 to 21 steps inside the internal code, basically now it only does four. Basically comes in, looks at the headers, makes sure you've got privileges, and go, does the query and the character set and the client version that you're working with match what I've stored over here in the cache? Yes, send back preform network packets, it's done. Okay, there's no parsing, there's no optimizing, there's no reading from disk or anything like that. So that buffer alone uh, can, can very much help you. There is one other global buffer, but that really is not important unless you get an error message saying that you've run out of space. Um, those three things alone can make a difference in your system. So tuning for memory is important. I mentioned uh, important things about backup and recovery. Ironically, uh, another customer last week, um, not the first customer, in fact, on my website I have a blog post about the my, the first 10 things you should do about backup and recovery. It's not all the things that you should do, it's a quiz of these are the first 10 things. I have yet to find one customer that gets 10 out of 10. So um, I had a customer who's running a production system and they don't have binary logging enabled. Binary logging is MySQL's version of an archive redo log that records every statement that's executed Necessary for replication, but also necessary for point-in-time recovery. And when I explain to this customer that, yes, we do a backup every night, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I go, well, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, do you know you've just lost the last 10 or 12 hours of data? Because you can't recover because binary logging is not enabled. So if you care about your data, then you need to make sure you have the server ID set. Uh, there should be a little equals and a number after that. And the binary logging enabled. And as all good system administrators are, you would also want to make sure you have an off-site backup of that data uh, at regular intervals. It's a, a append only files. So what's happening tomorrow in the MySQL ecosystem as I wrap up, um, I do have a crystal ball, uh, a MySQL crystal ball. I do not know how to read it. So I can't tell you what's going to happen. Um, what I can say is MySQL 5.7 is on the way. Um, Procoder are working on GA 5.6, MariaDB is going off on the 10.0, um, other storage engines will probably pop up. Uh, it's going to happen. Oracle is investing uh, time and money and energy. They actually have more engineers on MySQL now than they've ever been in the past. So that's a good thing. Um, I don't work for Oracle. I'm not sponsored by Oracle. I'm not saying this for the benefit of anything else other than to say that they are doing a good job. They do have a stigma announced with them. They do not still understand the concept of community and open source as well as they should uh, and they have made some mistakes and other large companies have also made mistakes. Um, but what's interesting is there's already been some change up to what's going on. I wouldn't be surprised to see that the next version, which is also two years time, which ironically is after the five year thing that uh, the EU had to then agree to like a certain criteria after five years, so just maybe coincidental. Um, but I'm suspecting that MySQL will move closer towards being just a, a single storage engine that be an NODB. They've already started releasing a memory based version of that which would effectively replace the memory storage engine and I'm quite confident that MariaDB, uh, sorry, my, my ISAM which is you know the fork from MariaDB, that legacy code uh, which is only for the metadata right now will disappear. Um, what will happen as a result of doing that is MariaDB which is effectively what is now being included in distributions, what is uh, effectively in the past been known as the <coughs> most fully compatible version of MySQL world will continue to diverge. It's already diverging now with 5.6. So uh, is that a risk? I don't know. But if you feel strongly about any product, whether it be MariaDB or Pocona or MySQL, uh, I don't have any feelings in any way. I have customers that use all three of them for different reasons. Generally, there's no reason to move away from uh, the Oracle version unless you have some specific issue, uh, whether it be philosophical or performance-based. But if you've made a decision to, to, to uh, go in bed with MariaDB, just be aware that there are things that are happening in the system and around it that may affect that decision in the years to come. Um, and um, that may affect distros that include it. I don't know. I, I, I kind of 
hope for the best so that everyone plays well and that you see more options available and they're easy to install and configure. And that I'm sure everyone here who's an open source advocate would, would uh, agree with me. Um, but hopefully this has helped to at least give you some education in that respect. Um, in that regard, I've talked for way longer than I generally would normally. Um, and I've not had any questions, so that hasn't given me a chance to actually stop. Uh, so we're going to do the question and answer thing. I think we also have a few books to give away. Is that right? Did you have that? That's right. So uh, you, will, uh, well, you will have a bunch of questions. Yes. I actually have... Um, do you want to do question and answer first? Do you want to do a giveaway first? Well, let's do question and answer because a good question may prompt me to give a book away rather than... Uh, <laughs> that's your, your prerogative. Answer. I will say, uh, for anyone who's looked outside, it's raining cats and dogs. If, if, if I'm not a really good weatherman, but I took a look at the Doppler radar app, and it looks like it's going to thin out soon, so I don't think we're in a hurry to get out in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if, if anyone thinks that's a problem, you know, let, let me know. I think we're good for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, hopefully by then, most of the rain will pass, and I'll kind of walk out without um, roads that I want. I didn't want. So I, I asked during the presentation, um, if anybody knew the third product that MySQL had, to MaxDB? I am. Very good. So there was a third product called MaxDB, which is which is no longer available. I think it was actually sold. It was I meant to be like... It was available yes. by uh, Adibus. Uh, by Adibus, yeah. So it was meant to be even like an SAP replacement. So um, that is so good. There is a choice of um, uh, uh, three books. You've got a choice of one of mine, two. I've written four books. There's two of my books for Paul De Beers, who is the documentation. Um, uh, expert at MySQL who has like a three-ton Bible here. Um, it's actually you know, it's actually a good book. Um, so take your pick. Do you want to know about MySQL? Do you want to know about all the types of replication, or do you really care about your data and backup and recovery? <laughs> actually, all three, but I'll take uh, backup and recovery. All right. Can we let me have a quick note, everyone. So raise your hand and get get picked for the answer. I don't want anyone to get upset if they shout an answer out. Yes, yeah, no, that was just one question I specifically asked. I expected no one to know, so congratulations for actually getting us a bit of uh, MySQL trivia. Um, if, if I can't give away books, I'll ask another MySQL trivia question. But right now, any any general questions? I know it's hard to like bottle them up, so uh, there's a microphone I'm going to come to. Just raise your hand and um, before I finish. Yeah, one technical and one non technical. So, one uh, technical is why, uh, just because. Uh, MySQL has been merged with Oracle, MongeDB, and what roadmap for MongeDB? So how, yeah, commercial companies are commercial and non-commercial companies are encouraging open source compared to MySQL. What? And non-technical is, is uh, MySQL and MongeDB are daughters of uh, Monty. Yes. Uh, okay, so the uh, the first question was really about MariaDB and how it's going to evolve as a company in comparison to Oracle. So uh, MariaDB, or Monty program, the company behind MariaDB, uh, which recently merged with a company called SkySQL. MariaDB provides the software, generates a lot of revenue from NRE, non-recurring engineering, which is you know patches and modifications to the product. SkySQL is a services company that provides support, training, uh, education, etc., which is a little bit like what MySQL, the company, used to be. So that's you know the way in which they're wanting to like work with their revenue model. Um, I don't know how profitable that's going to be. That's you know how MySQL originally started, um, but obviously you know they have um, engineers and, and people that do that. So they Monty has promised to keep it being GPL. Um, and uh, if anyone has met Monty, and um, <coughs> if you have, then you would know what black vodka is. Uh, um, <coughs> <coughs> then you would understand that he's, he's pretty set in his way. So the second question was about um, his uh, children. So uh, Mai is actually one of his daughters. Maria is another daughter and he has a third child called Max. Who gives? <laughs> uh, so uh, I, Monty was speaking recently, I didn't attend his meeting, but um, you know, for people in the company, we had, uh, we had a company meeting in um, Orlando in 2008, it's actually where they announced the Sun uh, acquisition. And seriously, at 9 o'clock in the morning, you know, 350 plus employees who come from around the world were given a shot glass and a black vodka. Um, so uh, you need to understand that's a MySQL tradition. I've done it at my group before. Uh, any other questions? 
It's got to be at least one question that's I can, I can fill in the blanks. If no one has a hand up right now, oh, why don't you go this one? Is somebody over here? Audience first, we'll fill in the gaps when you guys are thinking. Um, can you give us a succinct speak to uh, Postgres versus MySQL? Like, it can be very short, but like. Yes. Which, when, why, not license based, just. No. Your opinion. Yes, actually, uh, my experience comes from Ingress. So, way back in the day when Postgres forked off Ingress, long before MySQL was even formed in someone's eye. Um, you know, if you actually look at the family tree, it's really quite interesting uh, divergence of things. Postgres has remained quite small and, and, and closed knit. Um, in some areas, it has more function. Sorry, it's not a system, man, so that's fine. Uh, in some areas, it has more functionality. It's very good in the GIS area, it's very good in mathematical computations. Um, and in some respects, it's, it's a better product for certain workloads. Um, ironically, of all the open source database products which is better than, than MySQL and Postgres is actually Ingress itself. Uh, it's still to this day a more fully featured product which is basically being shelved. Um, so, um, go figure. Uh, you know, look what happened with Microsoft, they got lucky. You know? So, um, some companies are like that. There, there are very admin people that work inside Postgres, there's the enterprise DB sort of commercial side of things. I can't comment as to the pros and cons of those, mainly because I really don't work with it. Uh, if someone is uh, if someone is using me as a data architect, then I'm really going to advise them uh, in a relational database perspective to use MySQL, and you've probably gone that way, and then what not to put in the database, because people abuse that. Um, but if you're saying, I'm deciding between Postgres and MySQL, uh, I'm not in the best position to actually give you an answer. My advice would be if you have an expert in Postgres and you, and you don't need any fancy features, then go with Postgres. In your experience, what are the best and worst uh, language is that interface with uh, MySQL? Um, so the question was the best and worst languages. Well, um, I'd have to say the worst language is SQL, the structured query language, which is the ANSI standard. And I started, uh, I think I had my first exposure to SQL in 1988 by reading a book uh, called An Introduction to Relational Theory by C.J. Date, Chris Date. And he was one of the forebearers, you know, there's EF Cod and there's Michael Stonebreaker, which is popular from the, you know, Vertica days and bashing my school and other sort of days. And, and they're, the, they're the people I read about uh, in the late 80s. And it wasn't until I sat down with dinner with Chris Date uh, and in fact, I've had dinner with him twice uh, in Finland, where uh, I understood uh, just how far relational theory is different from the current what's called relational databases, and why SQL uh, in some ways is really a crappy interface. Uh, Ingress created a thing called Quell, which was much better, and if you actually look at the relational database theory, and if you actually go back to the math, I mean, I'm a mathematician, so if you actually understand the concepts of sets, uh, SQL itself is actually doing a disservice. Um, so, uh, long and short, that's, a, that's an interesting answer. People ask about different programming languages, like, okay, should I program in Python, should I program in Perl, should I program in whatever? Uh, at the end of the day, my advice would be this. If you have somebody who knows how to develop, or you have a development team, and they're familiar with a product a programming language, and it's not something that you know, there are only five other people in the world that know about it, then generally you're okay. What's the problem is not the language, <coughs> it's the framework and this thing called ORM. Okay, and, and the reason why I say that is because the worst thing that can happen to a database is, as I first started, SQL. And simply it's the amount and volume of SQL statements. And I, I have a saying and I want to create a talk on it. And basically it's titled, Do Less Work. Okay, the best tuning tip that I can give every single person here is the database is generally one central area and you can very easily create load balances and cache servers and web containers and things like that, but scaling in a database can be difficult. Um, and every single customer I look at, I see people running queries against the database and they don't need to be running them, they need to be combining them, they're duplicate, and you understand the concept of working with a chunk of data and working with one row at a time. So um, the actual best and worst is <coughs> Who knew that that was going to be the answer? Yes, there's one behind you, right? 
Um, if you had to pick uh, an ORM, would you do, do you have a favorite of the of your bad choices that you're saying don't use ORM, but if you did, what would it be? Well, I have to say don't use one actually. I just looked at something last week and I think it was it was, it was it called lithium? The first one was lithium technologies, but it was I think it was lithium ORM and it was woeful. I mean I want to know why their site's running slow, because there's two hundred SQL statements below the front page. Um, so an ORM uh, yeah, and I remember back in the first days, um, um, back in like Java 1.2, and I can't remember the name of the product now. Um, uh, an ORM really is productivity tool for developers, and the reason why developers like ORMs is because it speeds up productivity. But a developer has no vision for the total cost of ownership of the project. Okay, and in this day and age, there's all these gung-ho people that come out of university and I'm all for open source and I'm all for entrepreneurship but if they have no concept and no experience they don't understand what the cost of a total system is so ORMs and frameworks are bad oh, I've said that in the past and I will always well, they're bad for relational databases I should put it that way <laughs> um, and, and, they're, and they're bad for one reason they're not interested in database design they're, for lack of a better word just going to persistent storage. In some, in some respects, I should say to people, just put it in the file system because all you're doing is incurring a SQL parsing overhead um, for getting out a blob or something. Um, I hate to say it, there is nothing. I mean, if you want to, if you want to have a framework, then definitely have an MVC, very lightweight framework. But for example, um, I do my own work uh, with customers on my own projects. Um, I've built my own uh, um, object action implementation. I've actually documented how to do it. And the criteria of this is very simple. You have an architect. Okay? Every single SQL statement has to be written, handwritten. It's in effect an anti-ORM. It's a framework that really speeds up development. I can whip out things so fast, but it's an anti-ORM. Uh, because ORMs that generate SQL uh, never generate nice SQL. I'll go one step further to say that I've gone, uh, I've seen an example of a .NET ORM, which is a name I can't remember, but I can dig up on my client files, that took a database and did so many joins with the query that it actually crashed Amazon RDS. Okay? <laughs> and the reason why was because the database itself was basically one gig in size, but the joins it was doing to create a temporary table was generating like 10 gig of data for one query. And they wanted to know why the system wasn't responding. Well, literally, Amazon was actually running out of temp space, and Amazon RDS is a black box, so therefore you can't do anything. Um, so, yeah, uh, all ORMs are bad for databases, period. So you might suggest an ORM that allows you to substitute your own queries and key parts? Definitely, if an ORM has the, if an ORM has the capability, like a high money or something else, where it can generate SQL, and then you can actually rewrite the SQL, that's good. If you can create a thing called lazy instantiation, so that is in an object, an object basically is sucking in all of its child, child attributes. If you can say to it, okay, don't suck in all those child names into those 10 table joins, but only get certain information at certain times, uh, then that can help. But, you know, I, I know ORMs, and, and even the largest, uh, even the largest companies um, can do this in an ORM, and, and I go, you know the ORM does like this statement, this statement, this statement, so they didn't even know because they've never looked at the SQL statements That's or the, the communication. Yeah. That's the point, is that, that you don't look at it. Well, yeah, and, and in this day and age, developers don't even know how to write SQL. I think one reason why no SQL is so cool, so cool is because they didn't know, they've never been taught how to write SQL. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying SQL is great, okay? It has a lot of shortcomings, but SQL is the standard, and every relational database to this day uses it, and every relational database in the future will continue to use it. And if you want to work with data, the data store, Sooner or later, you're going to touch a relational database, so you need to learn SQL. And if you're an administrator, you need to learn the simple command like show process list and kill query. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, there's one question over there. Uh, sorry, Ryan. Um, so, my SQL today, is it um, is clustering built in or not? Or is clustering built in? Like, like this question? Multiple uh, right, right, right. rights. Okay, so the question was, uh, is clustering built in? So this is a complicated question, 
um, which is really good because I'm going to give you the book about replication techniques because I'm going to talk about some of the things in the book. Um, MySQL by itself is a single service, so it's a single process, it's a, it's a multi-threaded single process. Unlike Oracle that runs multiple processes, it's really just one underlying MySQL D process, but it's multi-threaded. So it can handle concurrent threads and therefore you can actually get thread crashing if someone crazy says, I need to support 5,000 connections, so I'm just going to make max connections 5,000, well then you just shot yourself in the foot because you can figure a few other memory buffers and you think they're global buffers, but they're per session buffers and you'll run out of memory. And MySQL is an unbounded memory process, you can't limit the per session case. So you can read and write multiple queries to a single MySQL server. You use MySQL replication to create different copies or replicas of the data, whether it be a full copy or a partial copy of the data. You can change the structure so you, for example, have different indexes. Uh, I've heard of customers that will have different slaves and different indexes to run certain queries against them so they're more efficient. Um, clustering in itself, uh, if you're using the word term, uh, the term clustering, then you're more likely to talk about MySQL cluster, the product which provides synchronous replication between n nodes in a shared nothing architecture. So at any point in time, you have like a 4-node or an 8-node or a 24-node server, there are multiple copies of the data that are available um, in a synchronous way. So Galera is one of those products that's trying to do that inside MySQL server. Um, so your, your question probably depends a bit more on like, uh, you know, um, how many different types of ways you want to write the data or how distributed or fault tolerant the data actually is. Um, but all those things really, including Galera and Tungsten, fall under this book, which is called Replication Techniques in Advance, which will you know, answer in a lot more detail what I just summarised. So, congratulations. I have one more book. Any more questions? I, I actually would like to ask yes. a quick question. I hope it will be quick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry but, um, is there at this point in MySQL a query you can run that will tell you what the fragmentation is of your indexes? I've heard Facebook say internally that they can tell how fragmented they are, but they haven't said whether that's public, I don't know. Um, how fragmented your indexes are. Um, I think technically you can probably do it. There are some really hidden internal IDB commands that you know even you know educated humans can't read. Um, there are definitely some statistics that can tell you now both in Bacona about how much usage there is. I'm not sure if any of those are smart enough to say, you know, it's really, really fragmented. Um, unfortunately, if I had the first book of my series, I would give it to you because in that book I discuss, <laughs> I discuss index theory and how fragmentation comes about. Um, so let me actually just give you a tip here. Um, if you're an administrator and you're using MySQL and MySQL has my ISAM, and the administrator and the users keep saying, I keep getting this error message saying too many connections. Has anyone heard of that kind of error before? Mm -hmm. And if your solution is to increase max connections and you keep increasing that number, that's kind of bad because uh, you're just hiding the problem. Uh, generally, one source of that problem is, is you're using my ISAM, which has table level locking. And so one solution to do that is to switch to using INODB which is row level locking, so therefore you have different locking granularity. But with any change comes great responsibility. One of those responsibilities is generally the disk footprint is now two to three times larger. And it's not even to do with fragmentation, it's actually to do with fill factor. Um, so fragmentation is more about if you're doing lots of inserts, you're doing lots of deletes, um, how is the indexes themselves and the B trees actually being fragmented and, and having to be optimized. But fill factor, particularly in NDB, is another uh, complicated problem. But that is at least an option in right? No, it's not. Oh, I thought that was an option on the next one. Um, so uh, just to, to, uh, to, to leave you with another tip, tip bit of information, again, in that first book, that really actually, I have a whole chapter on theory, which I thought no one would read. And I keep saying, you should really read that page on theory, because it actually shows you, you know, what a B tree index and how it works. With NODB, uh, its primary key is a clustered primary key index. And what that means is it orders data within the page, is not actually inside an individual page, which is actually another uh, interesting tidbit. But it orders the data. So if you use a auto-incrementing primary key, i.e. auto-increment, then it will tightly pack that data 
into 15 sixteenths of a data page. Don't ask me why. It's 92%. I don't know. But generally a page is 16K, but they fill it to, to 15 sixteenths. And when you, you know, discuss with uh, Oracle architects at eBay because they hate MySQL and they go, why is it 15 sixteenths? Why can't I make it more? And, you know, it's a philosophical discretion I can't answer. So 15 sixteenths is great. But if you have a non-incrementing primary key, if you have a natural primary key, the fill factor is 50%. So that means that by default, your NODB pages that are stored on disk are only half full. So you talk about fragmentation, a bigger problem is actually fill factor. Um, it depends on that ORM, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> actually, actually, in this case, that's got nothing to do with the ORM. That's to do with database design or database architecture, another lost skill in this uh, new age. Okay. Um, but you, you, raise a, you raise a very valid point. One of the problems with MySQL over many years, and it's still a problem, is its lack of instrumentation. Okay, Pocono, for example, has all these extra things that give you instrumentation. MySQL 5.5 introduced the performance schema, 5.6 have got better, and there are more NODV information schema tables. So the reason why I'm not sure if the fragmentation answer can be answered is because I can tell you now that in the latest versions, you can actually see all of the data pages and what are actually, you know, not just a buffer of what dirty pages and what's clean, but actually what are in pages. I don't know if there's a column that would indicate how full those pages are, um, which could then potentially derive, you know, a fill factor and a potential point of fragmentation. Um, it's a complicated question. It's a bit of black magic even for experts. Yeah, sorry, I was just hoping for the same this Yeah, uh, it's, it's possible. Uh, I just, couldn't tell you because honestly I don't know. Um, but you know, I, I could spend a few days like trying to research that for you. you know, my rate is pretty reasonable. <laughs> uh, right. I had a question. Uh, one of the you know supposed differences between Postgres and MySQL is that the query uh, optimizer in Postgres is tightly tuned to its only database engine, basically. And in and the MySQL side, you mentioned in your talk that one of the issues with having all these pluggable backends is the uh, SQL optimizer isn't uh, tuned to any particular one or it might be tuned for whatever. Do you see with uh, Oracle and uh, MariaDB any changes in that? Maybe like a pluggable SQL optimizer or anything like that? Or the fact that you're saying they might be getting rid of MyISAM and Oracle changing anything about this? Uh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, if you want an organizer, I would almost give you a walk. Um, so the the actual the parsing part of it is a little bit uh, sort of antiquated. That's just really the syntax checker. It's the optimizer itself, and the optimizer is really a very complex chunk of code. And one of the things that Monty's claim to fame is is that when he created Monty Program, he took all the optimizer team with him. Um, and I think he took most of the optimizer team. There 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 are a handful of people that really know how to do those things. It's not that the optimizer is not tuned for the different storage engines. It's just that the optimizer is tuned for the way MySQL operates. And some storage engines want to pass different hints or want to have what's known as like engine condition pushdown that says, don't the, don't the parser, don't make a decision on what I want you to do. I want you to push that down the storage engine because the storage engine wants to make the decision. They did that a bit in the cluster. So MariaDB has made more optimizations. Um, and some of those optimizations have got back into the main Oracle code. It will continue to diverge. Um, Drizzle became a, Drizzle basically became a jigsaw puzzle where they just pulled it apart and you could plug in things here and plug in things there. You could plug in your own Drizzle replication, you could plug in this and plug in that. They never got to being able to pull apart the optimizer code because it's really, really hard. Um, the thing that I like is, is that Oracle has been in this business for many, many years, a lot longer than the MySQL engineers, and I think they'll continue to carve up and make improvements, particularly in the optimizer, um, because that's that's the way you want to work. MySQL right now is only a cost-based optimizer, okay? And cost, for lack of a better word, um, for simplicity comes down to how expensive is the I/O. Uh, it's very limited in how it can create statistics. Okay, between the different storage engines, like how does the optimizer determine what information have available to make a decision in the decision tree, like to prune away all the query options that aren't practical. So creating a better design, giving the optimizer less work to do, means the query will run faster. One of the things that MySQL does 
that Oracle, for example, doesn't do is it calculates the query execution plan, that is the plan in which it's going to execute the data, that's what tables it's going to join and how it's going to get the data and how it's going to shift it. It does that every single time we run a query. There's no way to say, here's the plan, like pin this query in like you can in Oracle. So as data changes over time, when you create a system today and you have friends of friends and comments and things like that, queries work great, but in two years time, when you have 10,000 friends and you have thousands of comments, the queries actually work differently because the optimizer has to make a different path. And if it doesn't have the right statistics to do that, then it falls apart. So the thing that actually sucks the most is the, the, the way in which you can have statistics available. And so I hope there will be more work done in that. There's been some improvements in 5.6 to at least save the statistics. But uh, in NODB, for example, I'll give, I'll give you a good example. In NODB, when it starts up, the first time it accesses the table, um, it actually randomly looks into the indexes to generate the statistics at once and will use those statistics for future queries, which may or not be the right path that you actually want to execute. And without starting MySQL, I think it's like some magic number of like one eighth or one twelfth. The table has to change by that much before it will randomly create new statistics. At least now they have a capability where you can save statistics, so when you start back up the server, it doesn't have to go through that, but there's no way to tinker with those things. I don't think there'll ever be a pluggable option. Um, I wish there was. I wish there was even that, that you know, Facebook and Google did works on, here's, to make, here's a way to make the parser better. Um, but I, they're so tightly integrated, I just, I just don't see anything going to happen there. Um, I, I do see that Oracle will hopefully bring in more intelligence from their existing team and make that better overall. Um, this is a question based on what you just said. I know that the MariaDB um, organization set up a foundation. Yes. And so the ownership of the trademark and all that is owned by the foundation. Uh, markedly different from what they did the first time with MySQL. Um, do you see that as um, increasing the likelihood that the improvements that Facebook and Google and other big users of of the MySQL code base, do you see that increasing the likelihood that they would contribute those pat, uh, patches and there would be a, a, more, a healthier upstream-downstream relationship that was reciprocal? Yes, so I think, uh, the, I think the foundation approach is a good idea uh, in, in any product uh, because you're removing that sort of commercialism from it. The issue that we have here is twofold. One, people are running patches and they're already available, that's, that's not an issue. Uh, the point is they'll never get upstream because the trademark owner is Oracle, not, uh, not the MariaDB Foundation. So you always have to deal with Oracle. And unfortunately, even now, there have been certain things that Maria have been, Maria have DB have implemented. Group Commit is a good example that dramatically improved performance of, of uh, batching transactions right to the binary log. But Oracle chose not to accept the patch. They chose to rewrite it their own way. So I think there's a certain amount of stubbornness uh, even in the, in the MySQL Oracle engineering side of things, whether that's Oracle policy or whether it's like the direction it's going, like I can't comment on that. I don't have visibility. But I do know that it is sad that changes will come out. Uh, and MariaDB is an example where they push their requests upstream. Most times Oracle don't accept them. And many times they actually try to rewrite it their own way. And so. The foundation only has limited capabilities because they're not the trademark owner. Right. Uh, what, I guess what I was asking implicitly was, do you think that there could be a, a shift in the focal point of, of the definition of upstream? Do you think Maria could assume uh, the focal point and, and really be upstream in that sense? Um, I, I feel, that if, if I had to give you an answer, I would say the um, ecosystem at the moment, which is fragmented, will continue to be fragmented. Uh, and the reason why is Oracle will continue to produce its best possible solution for MySQL so it's the best thing in that stack and more and more large customers, we're talking customers that spend ten million dollars a year on licensing and, and everything like that, that want the support are going to go with the Oracle MySQL version because it's going to be sort of like, okay, all under one banner where, you know, the, the other companies uh, are, are potentially, and other distros are potentially going to go down the MariaDB path, and you're actually going to see that it's going to diverge more. And I'll, I'll give you just one example why uh, I, I feel this is going to happen. When you go to Oracle Open World, uh, two years ago, 
when I apply for Oracle Open World, there's a, in the questionnaire it says, you know, how big is your company? Uh, what is your annual revenue? The lowest option was less than $50 million a year. <laughs> Last year, the same question, the lowest option was less than $100 million per year. Now, I don't know about you, but there aren't too many companies that MySQL well, historically have dealt with where they're above that limit. So Oracle has a very different focus of where it's going. Um, and Oracle uh, has many other database products, they have thousands of products, and they've always said, as long as a product continues to be profitable, they will continue to invest in it. Uh, and there, there, there are some other, I think it's RDB, I've forgotten the name of it now, it's a, a legacy product that, that's still being developed today because they're still generating revenue. Um, so providing MySQL is still generating revenue for them, and I think it will because larger mainstream customers will, you know, they, they, they have a $10 million investment in the financial system, uh, now they can bring in MySQL into that family, get Oracle support, know that they're going to get that type of things. What's going to happen is MySQL as a large community, which is very sad, will continue to break up into smaller portions and, you know, at the end of the day, it's the user that suffers. And I think... I think we're going to wrap up this part of the questions. I think we have a few more giveaways. That, that we do have one around. more giveaway, so... Actually, Oh, okay. Evo vouchers from O'Reilly. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Excellent. And so, I guess there are four questions you can ask when we get them in. I can ask four okay. questions, yes. So here's four, a, four smiles out there, right? Hands up. Okay, okay. here's a trivial question. This is a, uh, a, a, a um, question for you. Um, what is the shortest SQL statement? And if you get it wrong, then you're not going to answer any other questions. And it's sort of SQL statement in MySQL. The first hand I saw was you in the back. I'm going to say uh, drop database. Yeah, that's a little too long. <laughs> One, no. Close. Commit. No. Wow, that's it. What's that? No. Semi-dash. Dash, dash. Actually, it's not technically a command, but it's pretty close. Uh, I love that, that backfire. Now, the shortest command is actually do space one. Uh, one kind of test, let me call it. Um, but, uh, yeah, you were, the, you were the shortest. You were the shortest. So, uh, uh, so you win that question. Well, we typically give them a choice, so if you want to... Uh, oh, okay, sorry, there are three different e-books. Oh, oh, no, 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 sorry, 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 there's a physical book or there's an e-book. Go green. This, this, this is a little too complicated for me. Yeah, this, is a, this, is a, this is a very good book, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it is, and, but it's for serious MySQL geeks, you know, and I'm not... I wouldn't <laughs> would put myself to that level of serious. Um, so, um, uh, the next trivia question I ask is, um, uh, MariaDB obviously is the, um, the flagship of the MariaDB Foundation. What's the next version of MariaDB? Down the back in the red shirt. 10.0. Very good. You got it right. They're deviating from the 5 Series. So you have a choice of tree or no tree? <laughs> no tree. No tree. Alright, so you can come up like that. Um, I don't know, this is kind of hard. Um, really, it's anything you feel like. You don't, you don't have to actually... Um... Okay, well, let me put it this way. Uh, everybody in the room stand up. <laughs> Who's the first? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who here loves coffee and drinks coffee? Great, sit down, I hate coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that cold half the hood. Um, <laughs> Um, who here is an early bird that like gets into work before 9 o'clock in the morning? Alright, there's only a couple of gigs. You can sit down and I'm going to get out of bed before 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, um, I don't know. Um, who here worked with MySQL uh, before 5.0? Like 3.23, 4.0, 4.1? Well, those people that worked on that, you can sit down where you know too much about MySQL already. <laughs> Uh, we're culling the herd slowly. You want to throw something in there to help me out here? How many of your lefties? Yes. Who's left-handed? <laughs> right. Everyone, everyone else sit down. Everyone else sit down because I'm left-handed. Okay. <laughs> That's excellent. Because we're left now. How many? Two or three? One. We're left with two. I have two prizes. Congratulations. <laughs> left-handed, late starters who don't like coffee. <laughs> uh, which would you like? Book or no book? Book. Book. Yeah. Great. And that's for you. Oh, 
You're not left-handed. You're left handed but are you left-handed? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Well then, you know. Uh, <laughs> All right. Wait, then. We'll figure, we'll figure something. It sounds like it's yours. Thanks. I I I, I um, pick one of the books that are mine that I have, and I'll send you a, a free copy of one of my books or a uh, um, e-book copy. Of it. Okay. So it looks like the rain is still going. I think it's still a little longer, so I don't think we'll be we'll be staying here and waiting it out. But um, it is a little lighter than it was. Earlier. The bar, you guys can keep talking. Um, thank you very much, everyone. We have a Linux distro DVD in the back. Or I have one if you have any curiosity or if you're missing your other library.